All of the pipelines we have dealt with so far have been synchronous pipelines. This means that they are pipelines where all registers use the same clock. We have already talked about how the clock delivered to different registers is not an ideal copy of clocks to other registers because of skew and also because of jitter, which is a temporal effect. That is one area in which the synchronicity assumption breaks down. But there's another more fundamental area where we have to consider the fact that we cannot use a single clock in a big system. So most chips are very large systems that uh, are composed of many subsystems. Um, we call them systems on a chip. So each of the subsystems could be working independently from the others, and then sometimes they need to communicate with each other. This is um, most obvious in radios, in digital radios, where you have um, blocks that perform certain functions like the FFT or the modulator and demodulator, or even you can consider the uh, uh, transmitter and the receiver to be independent systems, or maybe even the physical layer and the Mac layer as independent systems. But it also applies to many, many other uh, areas of application like uh, uh, cryptography, for example, or even simple uh, microprocessors. Uh, the idea here is that these subsystems each can operate at, at a different frequency because each of them has a different critical path from the other subsystems. If we need to use a single clock for the entire system, then we are going to use the slowest clock, the clock that is dictated by the critical path in the entire chip. Because clock distribution is non-ideal, the assumption of synchronicity itself breaks down over large distances over the chip. So we would be making a uh, very tight assumption about using a single clock while at the same time not making very good use of it. The idea here is that some, some subsystems can work faster than others, and we should give them the ability to do so. This is usually the case when you can divide a large chip into a small number of subsystems, because ultimately you can only use a limited number of clocks on your chip. This is of course limited by the number of clock distribution networks that you can use. Now the problem is, if each of these subsystems operates at a different frequency, how can they communicate with each other? Well, it is true that communication between subsystems is uh, less frequent than communication within each subsystem, it sometimes does happen. And so sometimes you have a transmitter producing data at a frequency F1 and a receiver trying to sample this data at a frequency F2. It's important to notice that when we talk about this case, we're talking about independent frequencies, meaning that F1 and F2 are not integer multiples of each other. In the case of integer multiples, the problem is much simpler to solve. But here we are talking about completely independent frequencies. If you transmit data out of the transmitter subsystem at a frequency and try to sample it at an independent frequency at the receiver, you will observe a phenomenon that is usually termed metastability. Now, metastability is a failure mode, meaning that the system will fail and you cannot use it this way without modification. In short, you cannot produce data at a frequency and try to sample it at a different frequency. If you do so, your system will consistently fail. Now, in this video, I want to explain why the system will consistently fail. And I also want to explain why this is called metastability and what happens inside the registers of the receiver specifically that causes the failure. In the next video, we will look at the statistics of metastability, meaning that if we try to do this, how often will failure happen? And this will allow us to then think of solutions, think of small modifications to the transmitter and the receiver that allow us to use independent frequencies in both subsystems. So let's assume that the transmitter is producing data at a frequency clock one, and the receiver is trying to sample it at frequency clock two. 
So data is generated on the edges of block one. Of course, it's not going to be exactly at the edge. It's going to be TCQ after the edge. Now, the assumption here, and it's a very, very valid assumption, is that the transmitter is producing data out of a final output register and that this is synchronized to a clock called clock one. The receiver subsystem is also going to sample the data at a register. It's going to receive it at a register, but it's operating at a frequency of clock two. If the two registers were using the same clock, this would be a very simple two uh, register shift register and it would work without a, a hitch. But because the two clock frequencies are independent, there will be a problem. And the problem is that because the two clock frequencies are independent, we will have situations where clock two is sampling data by violating whole time. And we will have cases where clock two is sampling data by violating setup time. So you can see here that the data produced from clock one is not settling at the input of register two more than a setup time before the edge of clock two. This is a setup time violation. You can see here that the data from clock one is changing less than T hold after the edge of clock two. This is a whole time violation. So the violations all occur at the receiver register. And the, the fact that they have to occur uh, uh, is a fact because the two clocks are independent. Because they are independent, there will come a cycle where clock two will observe a setup time or a whole time violation. If the two clocks are integer multiples of each other, on the other hand, then you can actually work without any modification because if you ensure that data is produced properly at R1 and clock two is a derivative of clock one, then there will be no setup time or whole time violations. Now we need to take a trip into the register. Uh, this is particularly the receiver register. So we just need to revise what a setup time violation is, uh, what a whole time violation is, but specifically what a setup time violation is. So a register consists of a master latch, which is this part, and a slave latch, which is this part. You can see that the two latches are identical, except for the fact that the master latch is active low and the slave latch is active high. If you need to uh, uh, primer on registers and how they work, please seek videos in module six. Now, the problem with setup time violations happens when you don't give enough time for data to settle at node X, which means you don't give enough time for data to be latched properly in the master latch. So in the zero phase of the clock, the master latch is transparent and it's allowing data to uh, go through. You would ostensibly just need data to reach point QI so that when the clock goes high, the master latch becomes opaque and the uh, slave latch becomes transparent. Data can then flow from QI to Q. But the reality is you also need to give time for data to reach point X. The problem is if you don't allow data to reach point X, then when the clock goes high, transmission gate two starts working, transmission gate one stops working, there's a chance that the inverters I2 and I3 uh, have opposite values. For example, imagine the case where we have zero volt at the node QI. And imagine the case where we are trying to write a value of VDD to the register before the active edge comes. If we allow enough time for the data to go through I1 and become zero volt through transmission gate one for a zero volt at this node, and then through I2 to allow this value to update to VDD and then stop, then that is not correct. Why? Because recall that the old value coming from this zero volt at the node X is VDD. And so if we only allow data to reach point QI, then when transmission gate T2 starts conducting, we are in a situation where the output of I2 is VDD and the output of I3 is also VDD. This is not a valid state for the, ma for the master latch. This is not a valid state for these two inverters and positive feedback. 
and they will definitely leave it. If these are CMOS inverters worth their salt, then they will exit the state and will reach a stable state. Now, the problem is we don't know how long they will take to exit this state, and we don't know which state they will exit to. The reason we call this metastability is because what we want to do is we want to uh, close the master latch, basically turn it into storage mode when one side, let's say QI, is at this stable range of the inverter and the other side X is at this stable range or vice versa. What we do here is that we uh, force the two inverters to work in positive feedback while their inputs are in the high gain region, this region. This high gain region is not a stable region. It's not a region that you are supposed to give an input to an inverter in, and therefore they will exit it. And you can see that they will exit it because you have high gain here. So when you have high gain and due to the regenerative property of inverters, again, go back to module three, if this is uh, something you need to, to, to recall, these two inverters will exit this uh, state. So this is a stable range, this is a stable range, and in the middle, we have an unstable range. Now, there's a specific point right in the middle. This is the point of VM, VM, meaning that the input is the logic threshold and the output is also the logic threshold. If, if the two inverters are caught at specifically this point, they will never exit it. But they are never going to be caught at this specific point, mainly because they, you, can, you can never guarantee that the two inverters will be perfectly matched. And even if they are, there's always noise that will move them out of this specific point. So we don't call this point stable. We call it metastable. And the whole phenomenon of having to deal with a setup time violation because you are passing between um, clock domains is called metastability because you are actually trying to sample in this unstable range. Strictly speaking, metastability applies to a specific point, but this is the term we use for this phenomenon. So that basically means that node QI is not necessarily going to be 0 volt or VDD. It's going to be caught somewhere in the middle. It will exit this, you know, intermediate value and it will exit it relatively fast. But why, why is this a problem then? If it will exit it, why is it a problem? The problem is that we will not see the correct value appear at Q after TCQ. Proper register, if you give it data, a setup time before the edge, its output will change at the time of TCQ after the edge. And this is how the clock period is calculated for any pipeline meaning that at the receiver side, the clock period for clock two is calculated based on this assumption of TCQ. If data is produced more than TCQ after the clock edge, then the whole pipeline, the whole receiver pipeline will break down and we will get false values throughout. Notice that at the point Q, we don't actually see intermediate values. You will always see either a true logic one or a true logic zero, meaning zero volt or VDD. And the reason is, Whereas point QI might be an intermediate value for some time, point Q comes two inverters after point QI. And each of these inverters has a very high gain in the transition region, which means they will push the value outside the, the transition region, and you will observe zeros and ones at Q. So whereas QI will actually behave in a very weird way, you will see an analog signal at QI, and you can imagine three scenarios happening here. Let's imagine that we want to settle at, um, at VDD, that this was the, the value that the QI was supposed to settle at. You could actually see QI settling at VDD. This is scenario one. Scenario two is that it might actually go to VDD and then go down back to zero, or it might just go down to zero, which will happen depends on the mismatches between the two inverters uh, and when exactly we did the sampling, like we are doing the sampling incorrectly, but when exactly? When QI was higher than X or when X was still higher than QI, we don't know. The problem is 
that at Q, you will either observe Q going up, you might observe Q going up, then down, and then up again, or Q might actually go down. So you will observe a proper digital signal, except that it's behaving improperly. Because even if it settles at the correct value, it's just scenario one, it will do so more than TCQ after the clock edge. This is a failure. This is as bad as settling to the incorrect value. This is as bad as glitching, meaning that metastability is a failure for the entire system. Now we have to think about how often this will happen. If it doesn't happen often, then we don't actually need to worry about it. 